Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those who are joining us on site or online. Uh, welcome to our workshop. This workshop is called Decolonize Digital Rights for a Globally Inclusive Future. Before we begin, I would like to encourage both on site and remote participants to scan the QR meter, the code that's just on the screen here. Uh, and, you know, the link is being published on the Zoom right now to express your expectations for the session. And as a reminder, I would also like to request that all the speakers and the audience who may ask questions during the question and answer round to please speak clearly and at a very reasonable pace. Um, I would like to also request that everyone participating to maintain a respectful and inclusive environment in the room or in the chat. For those who wish to ask questions during the question and answer sessions, please raise your hands and once I call upon you, if on site, please take the microphone at this, the left or the right side, uh, clearly state your name, the country you come from, and then you can go ahead and ask the question. Additionally, please make sure that all mics are muted and other devices, um, and other audio devices are also muted just to avoid disruptions. If you have any questions or comment or would like the moderator to read out your questions or comments online, please type it in the Zoom chat and when posting, please start and end your sentence with a question mark to indicate that it's whether it's a question or a comment. Thank you. We may now begin our session. Um, okay, once again, so thank you for joining the session, whether you're joining us online or on site, and uh, it is going to be a very thought-provoking session that is going to delve into decolonization of the internet. Uh, I am Mariam Job, and I'll be your on-site moderator for today's session. Online, we have Nelly, who's going to be the moderator, and we have uh, Kiolo, Kioli Bojil, and my sincerest apologies if I miss the pronunciation of the name. Uh, he is going to be reporting for the session. Today we're gathered here to confront the very uncomfortable truth that the internet uh, is a space where everyone is not always equal. And it is very far from being a level playing field. Instead, it reflects and perpetuates historical bias and power imbalances. Traditionally, marginalized groups continue to face barriers in the creation and design of technology. Um, it, this often results to digital colonialism and uh, the dominance of privileged groups in shaping technology design often leads to the production of off-balance power dynamics. This has far-reaching consequences as digital content and platforms produced in the global north continue to be consumed by the global south. And uh, perpetuating linguistic bias and slower content removal from non-English content, regardless of the magnitude of hate or harm. The unequal response to these strategies, however, further highlights the disparity. While features such as safety check and on one click option to overlay profile pictures with the flag of country undergoing distress were swiftly activated after attacks in France, bombings in Lebanon, um, it failed to trigger a similar response. While platforms have also introduced fact-checking measures for major elections in the West, misinformation and disinformation via some platforms continue to plague the global South. However, the underrepresentation of authors of color on online knowledge platforms paints a stark picture of the inequalities that persist. Even voice assistants designed to assist and interact with users have been found to reinforce gender biases, normalize sexual harassment, and perpetuate conversational behavior patterns imposed on women and girls. This not only limits their autonomy, but also puts them in the forefront of errors and biases. Hate speech targeting marginalized communities continues to wage online, creating a very unsafe environment for those from the global south and those from the marginalized communities. Users in the global south also have the right to feel safe and, the feel, and to feel the same autonomy as users in the global north. In this workshop today, we are going to delve into the concept of decolonization um, in relation to the internet, in relation to technology, and human rights and freedoms online. Our esteemed panelists, who will be joining us, too, we have two on site and we have online panelists as well. They will unpack the evidence that exists um, 
of gender stereotypes, linguistic bias, and racial injustice that are coded into technology. They will shed light on how apps are often built based on creators' opinions of what the average user should or should not prefer. Furthermore, they will also offer recommendations on how online knowledge can be decentralized and how ideological influences can be delinked from the digital arena. They will propose practices and processes that can help de decolonize the internet and transform it into a tr truly global interpretable space. Through our sessions, we're gonna address three policy questions. One is that, um, what are the colonial manifestations of technology such as language, gender, uh, media, and artificial intelligence, and you know, that are emerging on the internet? Two is that how do we address these legacies that shape the internet um, and have become the ongoing colonialism and determines its future? How does decolonizing internet look like? What roles, the third is that, what role do different stakeholders play in the process of decolonizing the internet, uh, technology, and the digital arena as a whole? How can we better include marginalized communities in these discussions? We hope that by attending the session, participants will gain a deeper understanding to the, into the context of decolonization in relation to the internet and will learn to recognize the ways in which uh, bias is built into our technology and understand that it is not truly neutral as we uh, think it is. They will also discover the algorithms are merely opinions written into code, drawing data from actors, beliefs, and systems that perpetuate stereotypes and historical preju prejudice. Through this session, we hope to aim, we hope and aim to have a conversation on how really to ensure that we decolonize technology and digital space and pave a way for a more equitable and inclusive future. I invite you to actively engage, ask questions, send your comments, both online and offline. And I will begin by introducing the speakers. We have um, Jonas. Jonas is um, he's a postdoctorate researcher at the University of Ox at the Oxford Internet Institute from the University of Oxford, and he's responsible for co-lead of the Cloud Network Project inside Fairwork Foundation. He was awarded a doctorate in sociology from the University of Brasilia in 2019. Uh, we, he is also a program that we have, then we have Shalini, who will be joining us online, who is a program director at Medan. She provides support to fact checkers, newsroom, academics, and is involved in addressing misinformation. She, uh, she is also the co-founder of Khabar, India's only independent digital rural news network. And one of the next speaker is Ananya, who's here with us in person. She's the youth advisor of USAID's Digital Youth Council. Over the recent years, Ananya has been very active in the Global Digital Development Forum and has been, and has also been a Next Generation ICANN ambassador over the 64, the ICANN 64, ICANN 68, and ICANN 76. Ananya holds a master's degree in development um, and labor studies from Jawaharlal University. Uh, New Delhi. This is Ananya. <laughs> we have Pedro, who is joining us online as well. He is an innovation lawyer at Systema Industry. has a PhD student at UFBR with an LM with an LMM from the University of Coimbra. He is a board member of IODA, ISOC Brazil, um, and the Creative Commons Brazil, and an organizer of the Youth LACIF. We have Menda, who's here with us in person, Tevin. He is from GIZ and is a tech and policy lawyer based in Nairobi, Kenya. He holds a data governance, he heads rather, he heads the data governance division at the DTC GIZ Kenya. And previously he worked as a data protection advisor at GIZ. He also serves as the secretary of the Kenya Privacy Professional Association. And with that, we begin, uh, um, we begin the session today. We will start with Jonas, who's joining us online to have a brief uh, presentation. Yes, uh, Jonas, are you with us? Yes. Yes. yes good he afternoon. Is. Can I get uh, Can I get the possibility of sharing my screen? Yes, please. Um, let me see that. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can see your. We can see your screen now. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon for you. Good morning for me in London right now. And good, good morning even more for Pedro in Brazil. So it's an honor for us from the Fair Work Project to join this panel. I'm going to talk about the labor conditions in AI global production networks. And this is super important because normally we look uh, in the digital rights community to the effects of technologies like AI, but we need to look also to the workers who are producing that. So the first assumption is that AI development and deployment is super dependent on human labor. And unfortunately, this human labor uh, is characterized by a set of features that make it very precarious and with very, uh, let's say, insufficient arrangements uh, regarding a set of conditions like pay, management, and collectivization. Uh, when we talk about data work, we talk about activities like collection, curation, annotation, validation, and throughout all this chain, you have human labor. So uh, one, uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's important to know that it's not so artificial. So we need uh, like thousands of workers, and those thousands of workers are distributed all around the world. But this is distribution is not random or neutral this distribution express the legacies of colonialism. When we have big companies in the global north uh, who are hiring and developing these technologies and a workforce mainly in the global south. We can see here how the main countries are India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. We also have a workforce in the United States or, or the United Kingdom, but mainly global south countries are taking part in this through uh, business process outsources or digital labor platforms. The Fair Work Project uh, assesses digital labor platforms uh, against a set of principles. And we try to address the risks of platform work and the platform economy. And which risks are that? First of all, a risk of low pay. Our cloud work report launched this year showed how micro workers uh, earned around $2 an hour, and other uh, reports and studies showed the same. So, of course, that when you, we are talking about some countries, considering the currency, this may be not so bad, but what the studies are showing is that those payments, structures and payment amounts, they are super insufficient to ensure uh, like adequate uh, and meaningful livelihoods. Another problem is the excessive overwork and job strain. So this leads to health issues. We have workers working 15, 16 hours. Normally workers need to switch day by night because they need to be awake during the global north time instead of being awake in their own country time. And this uh, leads to exhaustion, uh, leads to problems related to sleep and very other mental health uh, questions that we've been found finding in our studies. Uh, also, workers suffer with short-term contract and precarity. So normally, if you have a business process outsourced, you have a one-month or a two-month contract. And when we mention cloud work platforms, you don't have a contract in a traditional sense. And these workers need to uh, search for tests all the time. Our 2022 report showed that those workers worked uh, eight hours uh, on unpaid tasks. And once again, this is a legacy that we see of colonial and capitalist regimes and work arrangements. Uh, those workers suffer with unfair management and especially with discrimination. And you can see this discrimination based on gender, based on race and ethnicity, and based on geography. And we can see the legacies of colonialism in all those. Also, data, data work uh, workers, they face uh, dispersonalized bully, and they are subject to extreme surveillance. Uh, and finally, another risk is the lack of collective power. And of course, that this turns into more asymmetries between workers and platforms. The Fair Work Project uh, is working across all over the world, almost 40 countries. It's coordinated by the Oxford Internet Institute and the VZB Social Center in Berlin and funded mainly by JSF, connected to the German government. 
we are assessing location-based platforms, cloud work platforms in AI, and we have these five uh, principles, pay, uh, sorry about that. We have these five principles, pay conditions, contract management and representations. We collect data from different uh, sources and we rank platforms and to finish our AR project. Join us, please help us round up. Yeah, I'm rounding up, and but this is the last slide. We are assessing specific AI companies, and when we try to do that, we try to show that the platform economy can be different, and to be different is part of the decolonizing process of AI technologies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jonas. That was quite insightful with you know data to back it up, and that we could actually look at the fact that these are concerning issues when it comes to the decolonization of the internet. Uh, we're going to take another five-minute presentation from uh, another of our online speakers, Shalini. Uh, please go ahead and share your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a presentation, okay. uh, but I made some points for uh, the discussion today. Okay. Thank you very much to IGF. Thank you to the organizers of this workshop. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the problems with AI in terms of gender, in terms of language. And I'm also going to talk about the work that Nidan, the organization that I work with, has been doing in order to address some of these issues. Um, so as we all know that there have been experiments that have been carried out with generative AI on how um, different image generators visualize people from different countries and cultures. And when we look at these images, um, they almost always promote biases and stereotypes related to those countries and cultures. Uh, when text to image models were prompted to create representations of workers uh, for high paying jobs and low, low paying jobs, High paying jobs were dominated by subjects with lighter skin tones and were mostly male dominated. Um, images that we see don't represent the complexity and the heterogeneity uh, and diversity of many cultures and people. Um, we also know that um, AI models have inherent biases that are representative of the data sets that they are trained on. Uh, image generators are being used for several applications uh, and, and many industries, and even in tools that have been designed to make uh, forensic sketches of crime suspects. And this can cause uh, real harm. Uh, a lot of the models that are used tend to assume a Western context, and the AI systems look for patterns in data on which they are trained, uh, often uh, looking at trends that are uh, more dominant. Um, and they are also designed to mimic what has come before, not create uh, diversity. So um, we're talking about inclusive, inclusivity in technology. Um, how do we ensure that AI technology is fair and representative, especially as more and more of us start using AI for the work that we are doing? Um, any technical solutions to solve uh, for such bias would likely have to start with uh, the training data that is being used. Um, and uh, to seek um, uh, transparency from uh, AI systems and from the companies that are involved uh, is also really important because very often these companies are very secretive about the data that they use to train their systems. Um, there's also the issue of language. Uh, often AI models are trained with data that uses mainstream languages. Um, often these are languages of the colonizers. Uh, many AI-based translation services use only major languages, uh, overlooking hundreds of lesser known uh, languages. And some of these are not even lesser known languages. So languages such as Hindi and Bengali and Swahili, which are spoken a lot um, by people and, and um, uh, by many people. Um, they also need more resources to develop AI solutions. Uh, and from a um, sociocultural standpoint, preserving these languages is vital 
since they hold unique traditions, knowledge, and an entire culture's identity while protecting their richness and language diversity. Uh, so in this context, what is it that we are doing at Nidan, the organization that I work with? Uh, we are a technology nonprofit. Over the last 10 years, as the internet has evolved and changed, Nidan has maintained a unique position as a trusted partner and collaborator working both with civil society organizations and with technology companies um, that harness the affordances of digital technology to communicate. Our approach has been consistent. We build collaborations, we build networks, and we build digital tools that make it easier for hyperlocal community perspectives to be integrated uh, into how global information challenges are met. We understand that our ability to work across community technology and policy stakeholders is a privilege, and this is our unique contribution. We see ourselves as facilitators and enablers of change, um, and we do this by developing open source software that incorporates the state-of-the-art ML and AI technologies uh, by building coalitions. A lot of these coalitions are built around large events, such as elections, uh, that enable skills sharing and capacity building. And this multi-pronged approach strengthens collaboration and the ability for hyper-local community perspectives and thank participation you. Thank in you. addressing... Thank you so much for that, Shalini. Thank you. That was, that was quite insightful uh, to learn about the work that you do and how they... they're you know, methods and uh, codes in that technology and that internet that is has been existing for as long as we've been using the internet. And, you know, if we don't tackle them, if we don't talk about them, if we don't even realize that these stereotypes, these gender biases are coded into our internet and the way that we use it to digital technologies, it we, we have a long way to go when it comes to decriminalizing the internet. Uh, we have, um, we're gonna take another five minute presentation or speech from another of our speaker. This one is on site. But before we do that, I would like to share some of the comments that we made about the expectations of the session. We see that um, people expecting reflections, you know, candid direction, uh, articulation, radical, honest manifestations. Of course, um, the link is still on the Zoom chat, so if you would like to include your expectations, you may still go ahead and make the comment. Ananya, you may go ahead, please. Thank you so much. First of all, let me begin by saying that I'm very happy to be here in Japan. And no, it's not just because Japan is such a beautiful country and the people here are so nice. I mean, well, of, I mean, of course they are, but also because I can finally live a day where I do not get spammed by calls from a range of companies trying to sell me their products, a bunch of coaching centers trying to send me to their engineering institutions with the aid of their tutors. By the way, I have a master's degree in development studies, so engineering was clearly never my choice. Um, random call center agents forcing me to invest in certain deals or just another customer support automated call trying to divert my attention from my work. The one question that always comes to my mind when my phone rings and the uh, True Caller app detects it as a spam call is how did they get my number? Who gave them my number and why did they give it to them? Why was I not asked? Given that it is my number, and my number is connected to very obviously a ton of different data related to me, and since I own both the number and any data related to that number, I should have been asked, but I wasn't. And I'm sure we are all very familiar with those lottery emails. I mean, come on, we have a dedicated spam folder where all those great deals and gone in a day bumper offers and their likes uh, of uh, you know, ad emails keep lurking. So how did they choose you or me? I mean, I have never been that lucky in my entire life, by the way. So who gave them our email address? And if they found our email addresses, are they going to be very far from our residential addresses or our bank account numbers? So the way we live our lives has become excessively dependent on virtual and online activities, and even more so after the pandemic. For instance, social media, inbuilt GPS, health apps, taxi apps, Google searches, everything, all of them require access to our personal data. 
Our details set to public or private are available for usage by online companies. The principal actors here capture our everyday social acts, translate them into quantifiable data, which is analyzed and used for the generation of profit. In the book, The Cost of Connection, the authors Nick Coldrey and Ulysses Mayas also reiterate this view by emphasizing that instead of natural resources and labor, what is now being appropriated is human life through its conversion into data. Meaning our online identities have become a commodity which can be exploited and used for capital gains, controlling our time and usage and influencing important decisions or processes in our lives. Hence the term data colonialism. But I know some people do contest the usage of the term data colonialism because historically, colonialism is unthinkable without violence, the takeover of lands and populations by sheer physical force. That's true. But let's take the example of the Spanish Empire's requerimiento or the demand document. It was made to inform the natives of the colonists' right to conquest. Confiscators read this document out demanding the natives' acceptance of their new conditions in Spanish, which no local understood. Now think of the terms of service we sign up to every time we join a platform. They're often unclear, long, full of jargons, which we rarely have the time to read, and so automatically, almost like a reflex, we click on, I agree. But do we really agree? Unknowingly, we are giving consent to being tracked online, being called at odd hours to be sold insurance policies for the children, by the way, I don't have yet. And hence, our ignorance, our implied or uninformed consent for uh, you know, these kinds of data collection provides a very valuable yet free raw material, data. Once a senior official from a very famous company stated that data is more like the sunlight than oil, meaning a resource that can be harvested sustainably for the benefit of humanity, but this very idea makes my personal data a non-excludable natural resource available for public use. But does it not contradict the very word personal in personal data? Okay, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. She's the only person who's been on time since this session started. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ananya. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute as well, a five-minute presentation from Pedro, who's joining us online. Pedro, are you, are you online? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, that's great. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're, uh, you're all well. I'm greeting you from a 4 a.m. pre-holiday morning here in Brazil. <laughs> Uh, but to get to the presentation, what I want to comment on with you today uh, during this session is just let me put a time here. Oh, there we go. Uh, is the results of a research project funded by a Latinx program uh, focused on youth named Leaders 2.0. It is an amazing program with many interesting and diverse phases. And I recommend you all to seek more information about it, maybe as a way to repeat in the AD in your regions. And for the sake of time, back to the real content of the presentation. <laughs> the idea here is simple, linking sovereignty, fragmentation, regulation as a reaction, and the theme that I try to force into everything that I research, intellectual property. So governmental regulation is probably one of the most important threats we have to the internet when we are talking specifically about the dangers of fragmentation, but it's important to see what is behind this regulatory proposal. So to be more precise, uh, what serves as justification for these movements. The argument that, uh, that I will try to put forward here is that even when uh, this is not the real reason that motivates its uh, public authorities, especially when I'm talking about authoritarian ones, hard regulation based, based on digital sovereignty arguments is frequently stimulated by distinctions that are originated in what we call digital colonialism be it from multinational tech companies or countries who have much more steering power on modeling the internet than others, even if that's not implemented in such a direct and explicit manner. Uh, we can see this when those larger multinational companies end up extending the legal systems of their home countries to every corner of the globe, subtly imposing alien legislation, even when it doesn't follow the standards of the national laws that actually apply. This is where intellectual property comes in. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, a result of the copyright reform for the information society in the USA, 
establishes systems of notification and counter notification and other mechanisms that are severely favorable to the rights holder, the copyright rights, rights holder. And the largest content-based platform seems to have repeated those systems all over the planet. Sometimes, of course, with great support from the international lobby of the uh, American uh, entertainment industry. And similarly, when I go to a Brazilian page, for example, that uh, responds to allegations of copyright infringements on these content-based platforms, I will almost always see explanations on how fair use works, which is an institute that simply doesn't exist in the Brazilian legal system, since this is a country that adopts a system of limitation and exceptions for permitted users of copyrighted works. Of course, this example may, uh, may seem strange to some. So how many people actually care about intellectual property when compared to discussions such as disinformation or freedom of expression? But apart from the fact that this, uh, all these areas are umbilically linked, in Brazil, for example, we even have a, a provisional measure, which is something like an executive bill that intended to create obstacle for content moderation through copyright, and mech copyright mechanisms. Uh, the most important point here is just to exemplify a much broader behavior that attracts a lot of negative attention and may be instrumentalized by ill-intended actors. If a national platform doesn't even care about conveying an image that will follow something as central to the idea of sovereignty as national legislation, you can only imagine what a full place that this is for movements that want to showcase the transnational interactions that are made possible through the internet as something dangerous or something that needs to be controlled. Summing this up, internet content and platform diversification, we're not talking about user experience and language accessibility, etc., is not the same as fragmentation. Not only that, it's not just not only the same, but this diversification with platforms actually adapting to certain cultural contexts may actually be an important tool against pushes for regulation that may result in fragmentation. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Pedro. Um, that was quite insightful. And now we'll take our last opening remark from Tevin from the GIZ Kenya. Yes, it's, it's working now. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Tevin Mwenda Gichonga, and I think uh, we've had quite a number of presentations, and mine is going to take a different tangent. Mine is going to show you how we are trying to decolonize uh, the digital future. So we've had all the things that are happening, and sometimes it sounds scary. So ours is more of, let's try and actually solve it. Let's put our money where our mouth is. And I'm going to make a short presentation of the project that we're working on at GIZ. As, I've, as you've heard, I work for GIZ, uh, GIZ Kenya, under the Digital Transformation Center, which is a project uh, supported by the German government and Team Europe, working together with the Kenyan government, specifically the Ministry of ICT. And in our own little way, I can't say we are perfect, but we are trying to see how we can do this with different aspects. One thing we must recognize is that, I know we've had a lot of presentations on AI, but when you declare the digital rights future, it's just not AI only. It has to be every other facet as well that builds up to the AI, and that's what we are trying to do in our own small way. So, so the project, as you can see, the objective is to support Kenya's digital transition towards a sustainable and human-centered digital economy. And I'm, I'm going to look at two, there are three visions and missions, but I'm going to look at two major ones that affect this panel. The first one is we recognize that we must make technology work for people. And throughout the presentations you've had, that's maybe where we are really going wrong, particularly in developing countries. It's, the technology being made at some point maybe is not working as ideally it was intended. The other one is to enable a rights-based and democratic digital society. So we really have to be aware of that. And so what approach did we decide to take with this, I can say, interesting experiment? 
is on one hand to leapfrog Kenya's digital economy. We decided the first thing we're going to do, and this is working together, is to support the local digital innovations ecosystem, to build capacities on data protection and IT security, to foster a data-driven economy, and to work towards a decent job creation in gig economy. And all these actually build up together to enable that. The other thing that we've done is to build Kenya's digital society, and this is exploring emerging tech like AI. We're doing a lot of work there, and that can be used for social economic benefits. I will sh slowly show you an example. We are digit assisting digitizing public services, but in a user-centric way, so that we don't leave anyone behind, and building capacities on data protection. And also, we focus on bridging the digital divides, and we do this by ensuring no one is left behind. So the youth, women, rural, urban, and also persons with disabilities. So what the approach we took is, as you can see there, what you see on the side are all our stakeholders. It's literally, we are the perfect example of an IGF in practicing and in working in everyday work that we do because at any one moment, like in my work, I deal with all those stakeholders because we recognize that fact. One of the best ways to actually achieve a future where decolonize digital rights will be you leave no one behind. So we have governments in our teams, we have private sector, we have civil society, and we have academia. So what has been the impact and achievement so far? I'll just highlight a few major ones, there are quite a number. The ones that uh, as, uh, are relevant to this. So the first one was a study on human-centered cybersecurity approach in the Kenya's fintech sector. So if you know Kenya, we are known as a fintech powerhouse in terms of the work that we do there. But out of that, we've also started creating some level of biases. So some of the things we've been doing is, how do you leave no one behind in this sector? Uh, the other thing that we've done is data protection and privacy from a gender perspective. And I think that's important because we, we always forget that the most vulnerable groups, particularly when it comes to data protection, in most cases are women. So we decided to look at data protection and privacy from a gender perspective and how to enable participation online. The next thing that we did was, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to jump to uh, our other, yes, strengthening, sorry. Strengthening gig workers' rights. So every year we, re we publish a report where we rank uh, digital labor platforms and under the Isle of Fair Work principles and how are they performing. And the other one when it comes to AI and leaving no one behind, maybe the one that I'm always excited about is building local solutions. And one of the things that we did, for example, working with Kenyan, actually, Kenyan entrepreneurs and Kenyan coders was we are now creating chatbots, the, ones that, the versions that you see of OpenAI, but these ones now are locally created. They're able to speak English, Swahili, a version of English and Swahili. And in that way, some of these products that are created are kind of geared towards the persons and they're able to help them. So that's just, and also in relation to PWDs, we developed the first ever continental-wide ICT accessibility standards. So these are just some of the few ways that we are trying to, I can say, decolonize digital rights. And I was just showing an overview of it all. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Evan. I think um, you know our collective efforts are always very well needed in this kind of issues. And uh, our panelists have shed light on the concept of decolonization in relation to the internet, uh, technology, and human rights and online freedoms. I think it's time that we engage in discussions that goes deeper into these concepts and explore the synergies and trade-offs that are involved. Our objective really is to understand how we can harness these innovations and these uh, issues to you know, responsibly create something more sustainable and, uh, and equitable for a, inclusive, a globally inclusive digital future. I would now like to ask, uh, we would start with Jonas, who is online. Uh, Jonas, what are some of the ways in which Cheap labor from the global south powers contemporary digital products and services. Cheap labor is key for our AI development, and this is why uh, lots of companies are using digital labor platforms because these digital labor platforms they circumvent the social protections and digital uh, labor rights. 
basic digital labor rights. And sometimes we're talking about the 19th century rights, like minimum wage or uh, freedom of association. And using that, those companies can benefit from this cheap labor. And those workers, unfortunately, are not being compensated, do not have health and safety protection measures, and don't have the rights that we talk about as, once again, from the 19th century to the 20th century. And unfortunately, this is becoming a rule in the data services uh, global value chains, including AI. And that's why we need to address this issue and talk about how to ensure those labor rights to workers all around the world, but focusing specifically on what's happening in the global south. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Uh, I have a question for uh, Shahili, but before I go on to that, I have a follow-up question to you, Jonas. Why are these conditions so bad, and how is it that the Fair Work Project, how is the Fair Work Project working to improve them? Jonas, you have the floor. It's to you. Why are these conditions so bad, and how is the Fair Work Project that you're working on working to improve them? Unfortunately, so far, the regulatory efforts, they are only uh, addressing on location platforms. Okay, um, we, we're talking about in, we're internet go where the internet governance forum and, uh, you know, we're having internet issues <laughs> and online. Uh, okay, so we're going to go ahead and move to Shalini since there's uh, internet blockage over there. Um, Shalini, what you mentioned some of the work you do at MENA during your opening remarks and what forms does online hate and falsehood take while spreading in the APAC region? Thanks. Um, I'm going to focus on the issue of gender in the Asia-Pacific region, um, and I'm going to focus on South Asia. So um, women, trans people, non-binary people in South Asia are regularly targeted with online disinformation. And this, in, this disinformation is propagated in an attempt to silence already marginalized individuals and make it difficult for them to safely participate in public discourse. Uh, much of the work on gender disinformation covers women in politics and um, those in, in the public domain. Uh, research also shows the narrow definitions of gender disinformation and the current focus on uh, women public figures are sometimes sidelining affected girls and women and gender minorities who do not have a public presence. Um, and, and gender disinformation, as we know, can take many forms uh, that includes hate speech, uh, intentionally misleading information, rumors, attacks on the character and affiliations of people, and attacks on private and public uh, lives of people. Uh, which impacts um, uh, people in, in a way that they uh, are either self-censoring or removing their social media contents uh, or living in hiding. Uh, there are direct and indirect threats to their lives and also um, generally enforcing stereotypes of vulnerability. Um, so what we're trying to do at Nidan uh, is that we are developing a data set on instances of gender disinformation to build more evidence for supporting research and policy action. Um, and we have brought together a diverse set of uh, stakeholder groups in South Asia to work collaboratively to define gender disinformation from a South Asian perspective, uh, to identify, document, and annotate a high quality data set of gender disinformation and hate in online spaces for better understanding and countering the issue. Um, we're going to use machine learning techniques in the process. Um, and as we document more instances of gender disinformation online, uh, we feel that uh, the, the technology that we use will also become better at locating additional content uh, and thereby creating a virtuous cycle. 
Thank you, Shalini. Thank you for that. I when you when you started speaking answering the question, I was gonna make a follow up question about you know some of the best practices and measures that you guys have taken in place, put in place rather, to counter online hate uh, that tar target marginalized communities. And with with regards to your uh, context, you're talking about women, but you answered that when you're talking about the data set that you guys are developing. So thank you for that. Uh, Ananya, Ananya, you talked about, you talked when you were making opening remarks, you talked about data, a lot about data and how really it's affected. It's the, it's the key, it's oil. And uh, so what are some of the implications of data colonialism and surveillance capitalism on digital rights? And uh, how can individuals and communities really reclaim control over their personal data that they, you know, sometimes are not even aware that they're giving out? And uh, how do they protect their privacy in the digital realm? Yes, apparently it's no longer oil, but it's sunlight. Uh, well, historically, the era of colonialism ushered in by boats that came to the new world to expand empires through infrastructure building and precious metals extraction. Now, like every other thing, colonialism is also going digital. It establishes extensive communication networks like social media and harvests the data of millions to influence things as simple as advertising and as critical as elections. Data colonialism justifies what it does as an advance in scientific knowledge, personalized marketing, or rational management just as historical colonialism claimed itself to be a civilizing mission. But yes, some things have changed. If historical colonialism annexed territories, their resources, and the bodies that worked on them, data colonialism's power grab clusters around the capture and control of human life itself through appropriating the data that can be extracted from it for profit. Data colonialism is global playing out in both the global north and the global south, dominated by powerful forces in both the east and the west. Unfortunately, regardless of who directs these practices or where these practices take place, they often lead to the erosion of privacy rights, such as uh, individuals' personal data is collected and analyzed and used without their knowledge or explicit or informed consent. And like you saw in the example that I gave you about um, the spam calls I get, uh, there is little to no redressal mechanism. I mean, yes, I can block and report, but can I uh, happily live, uh, you know, live happily ever after? Nope, because there will be yet another company which has actually, you know, employed another spammer waiting uh, to call me again to sell their policies. My data, your data are now in the hands of so many people that it is going to be extremely difficult for us to individually trace and then erase our data. Hence, this will ultimately result in a loss of autonomy and control over our own personal information. While our data may be widely dispersed, the power to capture and control our data continues to remain concentrated in the hands of a few. This can lead to a lack of transparency, accountability, and democratic controls over data practices, potentially undermining individuals' rights and freedoms. The collection and analysis of personal data can perpetuate existing inequalities like some of my uh, ABLE panelists have already mentioned. Training emerging technology on biased data can lead to biases in algorithms, unfair targeting, exclusion, and discrimination, and the list goes on. These practices can also be used to manipulate and influence individuals' behaviors, opinions, choices, threatening individuals and democracies. We have seen that happening already. Undeniably, ideologies such as connection, building communities, personalization will keep incentivizing corporations to collect more of our personal data. Hence, the only way to prevent data colonialism from further expanding is to question these very ideologies. Individually, we must prioritize data minimization, like be mindful of the information we share online or limit the amount of personal data we share with technology platforms. I personally do this by limiting my social media presence, which by the way is very good for your mental health as well. I, I like to call this digital minimalism. Further, think twice before you agree to the terms and conditions. While it is easy to be fatigued by the almost incomprehensibly long document written in complicated language, take time to think before giving into an impulse of clicking on I agree. 
So I'll stop with that because I don't want to uh, take more time than I have been allocated. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Ayaya. That's that's quite insightful. However, I I do have comment to make. Honestly, we we want people to be able to be at ease, be at comfort, be be safe on the internet, not have to be re restrict themselves from. Uh, using the internet or using social media. So I think this is something that we actually have to talk about again on another session maybe or towards the end of this session about how uh, we also have to talk about data, making sure that data is utilized with purpose, not just for spam calls like you experience. Uh, I will move to Pedro, who, Pedro who's online. Pedro, my question to you is, do multinational platforms care about the legal and cultural particularities of the countries in which they operate? Yeah, uh, I will try to shorten up my presentation as well so uh, we can give the floor back to Jonas at the end of the section mm. uh, so he can finish his. Uh, but I do think they care because uh, especially generating conflicts with cultural and legal particularities of the markets in which you are trying to sell your services usually mean less profits or at least more costs. But these concerns just go as far as the immediate costs of this adaptation can be considered uh, not too high. And this is a problem when you consider the difficulty of measuring, uh, measuring the indirect and long-term costs that platform would certainly suffer in a fragmentation, fragmentation scenario. Uh, for example, while platform is investigated in the research project translated uh, their main pages about intellectual property policies, but, but when you browse for more details, you'll notice that not even something as simple as the translation of some pages were normally done, or even the hyperlinks led us to English versions. One of them, which was not content-based, uh, had only the most basic page translated. And um, how is this reflected in the global human rights system that, as a rule, it still has the sovereignty of you know national legal system that determine the factors of jurisdictional contact, conflicts, rather? Well, uh, I think that this reflects directly on human rights. Uh, mm -hmm. Intellectual property is itself globally considered a human right, but what I mean here is that although we have some international frameworks, human rights are not interpreted the same worldwide. So freedom of expression is a good example. Some future see it as a much broader right than others. Copyright itself may be stronger or weaker, weaker when confronted with other fundamental rights, such as education or access to culture. So if platforms need to uniformize their policies around such concepts, they should at least do it in a way that is not so clearly unbalanced towards a single perspective. Especially saying that the user should follow as a guidance an external legislation is, quite frankly, a bit offensive, since it really wouldn't cost that much to get someone to do a quick review on the legal policies to let deliver some adaptation, this even if superficial. The problem here is this image that those platforms simply do not carry to some basic elements of some societies that they have uh, as markets for their services and products, especially when they see, when we see that they can evid evidently uh, uh, they can adapt. So as one can observe with changes made because of the German legislation called NetsDG, especially on social media. All right, um, thank you, thank you for that. And I will move on to Tevin here. Uh, Tevin talked, during his opening, he talked a lot about what JSZ is doing uh, with regards to working with the communities, especially the marginalized communities. And I wanna ask you, how, do you, how can digital literacy and digital skills training uh, be reimagined in, su in a way that uh, is such that it empowers the marginalized communities and bridges the digital divide? And uh, you know, in such a way that it ensures that everyone has the necessary tools to fully participate in the digital realm. Oh, thank you for the question. And I think I'll pick up from the question you asked earlier on do large entities care about the legal and cultural considerations. I think the lesson I've learned is you have to care about the cultural considerations for you to have any impactful trainings or digital skills. It's a case of you have to bring yourself to the level and be there with the partner that you want to achieve the training to. And maybe thinking of it practically is so how do you do that? How do you <coughs> actually demonstrate that you are aware 
of the person's context and how you can help them to kind of bring them up to where you want them to be in terms of lessening the digital divide. And I think how I look at it is, I normally look at it like a four step. And the first one is the stakeholders that you work with. Because more or less or not, you're always guilty of working with stakeholders who have no clue what's happening on the ground. You know, you go there, you tell them you're going to do this, then they tell you, yes, we've done a training. Then you go on the ground, you realize, oh, this was a wrong stakeholder. They cl clearly did not understand what was happening in this context. And that way you're really, really, your, your training doesn't have impact. The next thing I think I look up, I look to is accessibility. And how I look at that is in, re in relation to democratizing the knowledge. And by this I say, when you do a training, it should be one that you're actually transferring knowledge, not just ticking a box. I've seen there's a, there's a huge difference there because most cases we are ticking boxes, but you're not actually transferring knowledge and knowledge that actually helps them grow. And one of the things we've done with that, I'll give an example of, and I see my colleague is also here, when we were developing the AI chatbot, we basically brought, because it is a skill we were trying to transfer, we brought Kenyan developers in the room, we brought uh, other developers, I think it was from Europe, who have expertise in developing such models. And we were like, we want you guys to teach them, to teach each other actually, not just to teach them, it's to teach each other how to develop this, because they are coming with indigenous knowledge of how Swahili works to develop an NLP in Swahili, or a mixture of Swahili and English. Maybe they come with the knowledge of how to develop these systems. And what happened is after they developed the first system, the next system that you're developing, because they're developing another one for the Kenya's Data Protection Commissioner, it's the Kenyans that are running the show now. It's them who are developing everything. So you start seeing, you're slowly reducing that gap. The next thing is affordability, of course. Uh, if you really want p to create any impact, you have to create trainings that is people can, it also goes back to accessibility. And lastly, inclusion of everyone. And this can also be done practically. And one of the things I think I mentioned we assisted developing is a ICT standards for persons with disabilities for Kenya. So whenever you're designing a system, how do you design it for persons with disabilities and you don't leave them? Given that Kenya is digitizing a lot, but we are forgetting that whole area. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tevin. I, I think that, uh, you know, with everything that all the panelists have said, it always goes back to bridging the digital divide, digital skills, making sure that people are aware of these things and they know how to protect themselves, they know how to use it, and they know what the issues are and how to tackle them. And when, when it comes to any matter of internal governance, really, if you ask me, we're not going to go any farther if we don't tackle the digital divide. Uh, we're going to go back to Jonas, who, who, had an, who had issues online, but I think we have some time that we can spare. So he's back now, and uh, he was going to tell us about, we were talking about the ways in which cheap labor from the global south empowers contemporary digital products and services. Jonas, can you please tell us about why these conditions are so bad and how is the Fair Work Project working on improving them? Thank you so much. I'm sorry about my connection problems. Uh, these conditions are bad because platforms find found a way. I think my connection will, uh, I think I will freeze again. I hope I don't. <laughs> because platforms found a way of sync convincing digital uh, labor and social protections and by doing that companies can hire cheap labor and that's why we're seeing low pay health and safety issues and management problems all around the world a study has estimated 163 million online workers so this is a very representative number of people the fair work project assessed that plan platforms all around the world in those 38 countries. So we analyze and score those platforms according to five principles. So pay conditions, contract management, and representation in a scale from zero to 10, and we launch rankings. So I invite all of you to visit our apps website, fair.work, and you can see maybe platforms from your country and check what they are doing or what they are not doing to meet uh, basic standards of fair work. All right, okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, 
I would like to thank all our speakers, both on site and online, for sharing their insights, sharing their experiences, and uh, the efforts that they're working on. And I would open the floor to for questions, both on site and online. I don't know if we, um, online moderator, do we ha have any questions online? If you're on site and you have a question, you may go to one of the standing mics. Uh, you state your name, the country you're from, and go ahead with your question. We have one question on site. Hi, uh, my name is Daniele Turra. I am one of the youth ambassadors from Internet Society. I'm from Italy. So as the panelists uh, anticipated, mm, I am ex I'm understanding there are a lot of um, stereotypes, such as specific legal diversities that are not always respected. Uh, also lack of accessibility. Um, also the, the need to respect privacy. Um, and all these different problems and needs are not always really um, respected. And all of that is because of economic patterns and interests uh, worldwide. But some of them, for example, privacy, I would argue are also global rights. We can uh, discuss about also being them um, human rights. Um, I would uh, very be interested to see, uh, let's say, a taxonomy of specific local needs that are not um, uh, respected by specific technologies of the global north um, when it comes to culture, history, or political characteristics. Uh, so I would like also to understand uh, which are shared also with the global north and which are not. And with not, I mean not regarding people originally born in the global south that lately got to live in the global north, but specifically populations that plan to thrive in their own country of origin. So the idea is to understand which um, needs uh, are local and which are uh, global. Thank you. Okay, um, do you want Jonas to answer that or it's open to any of the speakers? Sir? Okay, so Jonas, do you want to take up this question? No, I think that uh, what I would like to say is that when we talk about this national and cultural context, what uh, Fair Work Project is bringing is that we have one very serious problem that has been addressed here uh, by other speakers, that is the biases, discrimination that is faced by users. But we also need to consider what is behind the digital technology production. And that's why we highlight this discrimination and uh, the consideration of the local context. And for instance, when Pedro brings the discussion on national regulations, we also need to consider as well the national regulations about work and how those national regulations, the national and local context, and the different populations and the diversity of uh, populations and cultural expressions can be uh, considered and in its own uh, characteristics in the internet as a whole, but especially in digital labor platforms and global platforms. And that's why I believe that this discussion that Pedro brought and now that we had with the conversation needs to look to those uh, diverse contexts and and groups, and at the same time, think about how to incorporate them uh, also, not only in the digital and data practices, but in the regulatory efforts as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm also going to invite Tevin to address the question in a very brief remark. Okay. Yes. So maybe you, you asked what are local, what are international? So international, I'll say privacy. Uh, I think you've alluded to it. That's, it affects everyone. It doesn't matter if it's global north or global south. We see it in Kenya every day. We have a data commissioner's office, and we actively work with them. And the same issues that are raised in European countries are the same issues that are raised in Kenya, even when it comes to AI products. It's, why am I getting these marketing messages? How did you take my data? Issues of consent. Where, where are you using it? Where Kenyans have become very interesting. They're even asking, where are you transferring the data to? You know, they're asking questions that you will find anywhere, and this is not just, I can say the urban Kenyan, it's even the rural Kenyan, you'll go and talk to them, and they're like, okay, I saw this application, however, they told me to do this, and I'm wondering why they told me to do this. So it's something that everyone is aware of. In relation to local, I'll say languages. 
because when you're developing, for example, natural language processes, sadly, most of them are geared towards global north. How the English, the pronunciation of the words is very different, the language is being used. But it's high time we start looking at local aspects of especially languages, because that's the only way you start bridging the digital divide, because not everyone will speak fluent English or fluent Swahili, and you need to develop products that cater for their needs. Yes, and uh, that is going to bring me to a question for Pedro. Um, Pedro, is the risk of uh, regarding the search for balance of power relations between countries, uh, is, is, is it a risk and uh, how does this affect the internet as a global network? Yeah, I would like to build upon what was uh, just said for, uh, by the previous speaker that I would use the same example but uh, inverted. Uh, I think language is an international issue because even though we are deaf to each country, it's the same issue that we have around the world. Privacy on the other side you can have different interpretation of privacy, what's most important, what's not. And that's exactly what uh, is especially dangerous when you're talking about platforms not diversifying what they are doing and how they are, do not do that in an international level. They prefer some regions to their others. So um, in a period that international relations are becoming increasingly tense and discourses against external threats are on the rise, it seems very easy not just to expose those true facts about how these relations work, such as talking about how these platforms may be an instrument of expanding the influence of a certain country or even acting directly on their behalf, as we learned with Snowden. But it's also easy to extrapolate this context to get support for actions that present the international nature of the Internet as a problem in itself. So doing those small things, such as translating the content correctly uh, adapting to national legislation may be exactly what we need to avoid having a spin internet, having uh, the internet as we know it severely affected in an active way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we have learned that we have some questions uh, from the online participants, and I would like to call on to Nelly, our online moderator, to ask the questions out loud for the audience. Nelly, you may take the floor, please. Are you with us, Nelly? Okay, it seems Nelly is not with us. And any other question from the audience here, on site participants? Nelly, uh, we think you're muted, Nelly. Please unmute your mic and take the floor. Technical, can you please give, can you please help us give Nelly the floor to Nelly, please? Unmute her mic. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, and uh, it seems we're rounding up the session today, uh, I'm actually very thrilled again to invite our speakers to share their invaluable recommendations to the following. What Barney should the... Yes, I have Was that Nelly? Uh. Nelly, is that you? Okay, we're gonna go ahead. If the, if Nelly happens to unmute her mic, we'll just take questions from her. But until then, we're gonna. I'm going to ask uh, the uh, panelists here who have shared their insights and experiences in for their recommendations regarding the following questions. What should decolonizing digital rights look like? But before I give you the floor, I would also like to strongly encourage the audience to seize this opportunity to share your recommendations, again, by scanning the QR code that's displayed, that's going to be displayed on the screen shortly. And um, now I would like to welcome Ananya. Please go ahead, tell us what should decolonizing the internet look like. I think this has just been done because I finished ahead of time. All right. <laughs> Um, well, let's say this, my blood group is B positive, 
There you go, you have another one of my personal data points. <laughs> anyway, being the positive person that I apparently am, I believe that every cloud has a silver lining. So this cloud of data colonialism presents an opportunity for us, an opportunity to create ethical systems which run on the principles of A, ownership by design, where users are provided with clear and understandable information about how, are they, how their data will be collected, used and processed, shared, stored or erased. It involves obtaining informed consent that is granular and specific, allowing individuals to make informed choices about their data. B, minimization and anonymization. Only the necessary and most relevant data is collected and processed, and wherever possible, such data is kept anonymous and encrypted. This reduces the risks associated with data breaches and unauthorized access while respecting individuals' privacy. C, there should be an option to be forgotten or easily revoke consent when desired. I know there are options to be forgotten, but the, the option to revoke consent has been a complicated process so far. D, mechanisms for accountability and redressal in case of data breaches or privacy violations are hard to find. This involves providing individuals with avenues to exercise their rights, report violations, seek remedies for any harms, and this should and must go beyond blocking and reporting accounts, um, and E. I just want to finally uh, take note of this. The, the whole entitled attitude that makes data colonialism possible must be done away with. Spelled simply, for example, I was born with a name. My name is a data point. Just because I provided my name to my school on the day of enrollment does not automatically translate into their unprecedented right over and unchecked use of my name for their rest of their existence. Data use is not a right, but it's a permission slip. Data reuse is not an entitlement, but once again, a permission slip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ananya. And I think uh, we've, we have access to Nelly now, so we're going to take the question from her online. Nelly, you may unmute your mic, please, and um, ask the question to our panelists. Thank you for... Uh, let me let you know my mic. Initially, the question arose according to your very interesting discussion is, uh, is like this. How can digital literacy and skills training be reimagined to empower marginalized communities and bridge the digital divide, ensuring that everyone has the necessary tools to fully participate in the digital world? Which of us speak? Can you please repeat the question, Nelly? Yes, of course. How can digital literacy and skills training the reimagined to empower marginalized communities and bridge the digital divide, ensuring that everyone has the necessary tools to fully participate in the digital world? Okay, um, Kevin, Tevin is gonna take the question. Just after. Um, I think just to help uh, Tevin answer the question, I think it basically means how we could use or at least program and structure digital literacy programs, which would, um, I assume, will help people to better navigate in a world which is uh, more decolonized. So how could digital literacy, you know, aid the process of decolonizing the internet? Uh, yes, mm. I think for that, I'll, I'm a proponent of, and I think I'll keep on reiterating, you have to bring yourself to the shoes of the person. So I'm going to give a good example of, we were having a discussion recently. There is this, in Kenya we have these ladies who sell groceries. So they have these little tuck shops. Whenever you go, you go buy groceries. And we were thinking, how do you enable them, for example, use digital tools to enable the sale of their products? And the discussions we are having, we are use, we are having is, so how do you how do you go to them, you know, because, and not make them come to you, if that makes, makes sense. Because in most cases, it's always us telling them, come. But now it's how do we go to them? And how do you go to them at their level and work with their skill? Because they already have a lot of that skill and just empower that. And I think that's what the, the challenge and discussion should be. 
and it's also something that we are also learning, I can say, because even in that example I just gave, it was just something that we are trying as well. Like, how do you go there? How do you work with them where they are? And, and I can't say we have the complete answer to that. It's, it's a learning process, but I'm a big proponent of find people where they are. Don't, don't make them come to you, because that's more burden. It's you look for them and work with them from where they are. Because one of the things that study was showing, even when you were talking to them, was how much knowledge they have. They do have a lot of that. For example, one of them was telling us, you know, you click on this, and I don't know what I'm clicking on, but it doesn't make sense when I read it. As, as and you just said, you know, it's the terms and conditions, and it's like 30 pages. You just say, I agree, and you move on. But they are cognizant of the fact I'm giving away my data. <laughs> that they're cognizant of. So perhaps it's coming to them and also breaking it down to a point that they also understand. I, I like that you mentioned that because there's a recent principle that I learned in digital development that you know you have to design with the user. If you're, if you're, because at the end of the day, w if you're looking to benefit them and they need to be actively involved in the process, they need, you need to know what their challenges are, what their perspectives are, what they think is going to benefit them and in, in include that in the process. And that's, that's very true. Um, I would like to continue the recommendations that we're getting from our panelists about what should decolonizing digital rights look like. Uh, we will, Ananya has given hers, so we're going to move on to Jonas online, who will share his. By the way, notes, please note that there is there, I'm actually sharing my screen, and there's a QR code where you're supposed to, uh, it should be on the padlock, it should be on the screen. Yes, that one. Um, you can just scan it, and or I'll send the link in the chat for the online participants as well to make their comments as well. So Jonas, please share your recommendations on what decolonizing digital rights should look like. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say that decolonize digital technologies involve not only decolonize the use of digital technologies, but also the production process. And that's why we need to incorporate the labor dimension to our decolonization agenda. And this means to ensure not only basic standards of fair work, that it's why what we are assessing in our project, but a radically and structurally different work arrangement where workers are not exploited, where we don't have uh, international, national, local, uh, and population groups asymmetries, and we are where workers are not exploited anymore. So I believe that we need to incorporate this to our agenda. And to quote a Latin American philosopher called Enrique Dusso, he says that it's not only about decolonize, but it's about to liberate oppressed people and to create something radically new. Thank you for that, Jonas. Um, Shalini? Yeah, um, I'm going to be very brief and say that um, in order to decolonize digital rights, it's really important to look at um, who is being included in the um, in in the process of uh, creating digital tools, um, we have to involve hyperlocal communities um, in involving in creating uh, data sets. Something that I talked about earlier as well. Uh, we also have to uh, make sure that there are people from marginalized communities who are involved in. Um, analyzing the data, annotating the data, um, in actually creating the technology, um, because uh, it's it's these people who who understand the context, uh, the language, and the issues much more than than you know technologists and coders and developers sitting somewhere else. Um, so involving the people in the creation of the technology, making processes more inclusive, um, ensuring that many, many languages are being included um, in the way that, um, you know, we analyze uh, data, uh, all of that is really important. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Pedro, what are your recommendations? Yeah, uh, I already talked a bit on, on my last uh, comments, but 
just to be very brief, uh, I think that platforms should try to diversify a little bit more to adapt to those local cultures and scenarios. And countries that are historically more influential in directing how the internet is modeled should actively try to share these powers, these capacities. It's just not about uh, just decolonizing the digital space, but preserving the internet as we know it as a global network and uh, of course for good. So that's it. Thanks for uh, your attention to everyone. All right, thank you. And uh, we'll take our last recommendations from our final panelists, Tevin. Uh, perhaps my recommendation will be to ask ourselves four fundamental questions, <coughs> and some of them have been alluded. The first one is who? Who's developing the systems? Uh, second one is why are they doing it? In most cases, it's for economic gain. If you're being honest, the, the baseline of this whole conversation is economic gain and what they stand to benefit. As Anya said, data is the new sun, and I always call it the politics of data. Everyone wants to be the ruler of data now. Uh, second is, where are they being developed? Are they being developed where the marginalized people you're targeting are? Because where it's being developed, because someone sitting at, in Silicon Valley, to be quite honest, they're not really thinking of me as a Kenyan using their AI product. I am the last person in their mind because of where they are. The last thing is what? What is it for by the end of the day? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, that's, that, that, that's very true. And um, I think all our panelists have shared very thought-provoking and insightful uh, experiences and insightful expertise on this topic. But as we conclude the session today, I'd also like to s express my sincerest gratitude to our online and on-site panelists for their expertise and thought-provoking contributions. Your insights have been very instrumental to deepening our understanding of the complexities that surround the decolonization of the internet and technology. And I'd also like to thank the audience, of course, both on-site and our, our online audience for your engagement and uh, for your questions and for being here today. Your participations have very enriched our discussions. In closing, I would like us to remember that the journey towards a decolonized internet and digital landscape, um, it's ongoing, it's, it's not static, it's not something that's already established, it's ongoing and it's a learning process. It requires continuous reflections, dialogue, uh, and call to actions. He asked, he talked about who's benefiting, what, and uh, you know, economic gain and all of that. And I think that together uh, we can strive for a digital space that is inclusive and respects and empowers all individuals, all communities, regardless of their background, regardless of their geographical location. We have to work together in order to create a future where the internet truly becomes a force of equality, justice, and liberation. Thank you, and that is it for this session. Thank you all.